So we're, um, last week we started in this series called Simon Says, looking um, at s- some of um, Simon Peter's teaching from uh, 1 Peter. And somebody asked me, are we going to play Simon Says every Sunday? Because if you were here last Sunday, you know we played Simon Says. And I said, you know, that's not a bad idea. We could do that, but I don't think we will. Maybe next Sunday, I don't know, to, to kind of break it up. But I did, I did want to say something that I noticed uh, or I thought about between last week and this week when it comes to Simon Says. Uh, who has all of the authority in the game Simon Says? Simon. Simon has the authority. Do I have the authority? No. no. I, if I tell you to stand up and you stand up, you're out, right? <laughs> Simon has to say to stand up. So not even the person talking has the authority in the game. Simon is the one with the authority. And so the correlation, I guess, for me is that th- this teaching is, isn't by my authority. It comes from a higher authority. And we certainly know that Simon Peter was an apostle. And we know that the apostles had great authority in the church. And they had uh, what they wrote down and, and we uh, put into, canonized into our scripture has great authority of our, our lives. So the thing that we're talking about this morning isn't just because I think it's a good idea or because uh, the, the church maybe as a whole thinks it's a good idea. It comes with the authority of scripture. It comes with authority behind it. Simon says, is really what we're saying is the Bible is telling us that these are the ways and these are some of the things that we need to do. Now, remember, Peter wrote this uh, epistle, this letter to a church to give them instruction. And last week we talked about uh, what it means to be holy. And today we're going to be talking about being built up, what that, what that means to be built up. Simon says, be built up. I know we just prayed, but let's pray again. And uh, pray for God's word uh, to uh, bless us and to be encouraged by it. And then at the end of the prayer, let's uh, say the Lord's Prayer together. We thank you, Lord, uh, for the scriptures. We thank you for Peter's letter. Um, I pray that your spirit would lead us and give us insight and understanding. Teach us and, and guide us and build us up, O oh God, into the people that you've called us to be. We don't want to... We don't want to do anything less than your will. And I pray that you would speak to us this morning. And now, Father, we pray as you taught your disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Um, Now, if you you grew up in the uh, 80s and maybe even into the 90s and you went to the middle school here, uh, you had the opportunity to take Mr. Lippelman's shop class. And I don't think they offer wood shop in the eighth grade anymore. They I don't know, something about power tools and middle schoolers just doesn't go. My favorite, oh, this is extra, uh, my favorite Mr. Lippelman story. And if you knew Mr. Lippelman, uh, he was kind of this big, really gruff. He was a football coach, wrestling coach, really gruff, rough around the, you know. Rrr. Anyway, uh, one of the kids, and ah, I can't even remember who it was. Anyway, they were running the bandsaw and cut his finger really bad on the bandsaw. And remember, the wood shop floor is concrete floor with sawdust, right? And he cuts his finger, and he's looking at it, and he, he I mean, he's just, he's like stunned. He's in stunned silence because he's nearly cut his finger off. And Mr. Lippelman goes, oh, it's Clinton. Clinton, don't bleed on my floor. <laughs> you know, absolutely no empathy for Mr. Lippelman. And don't get me wrong, I love Mr. Lippelman, and I love the class, but it was just kind of funny that his most concern was his sawdust-covered concrete floor. <laughs> So it's shop class. But, so we took shop class in seventh and eighth grade. And I remember our eighth grade year. In seventh grade, you kind of get introduced to the tools, you know, how they work and, and uh, what, 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 what woodworking is like. And then your eighth grade year, uh, help me out here, you built a, a shed, right? Did you do that, Andy, when you were in wood shop? Did you build a, a or you didn't? Uh, we built a store, like a storage shed, like you put in your backyard for somebody's. And uh, anyway, so we got the floor plans and we learned how to build this shed and, 
And uh, some people, I'm, I was, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of in the middle. My dad was a carpenter. My dad was a great carpenter, and I just did not inherit many of those genes. But I was kind of in the middle as far as the class goes. You had some guys that couldn't swing a hammer if their life depended on it. You had some guys that were really, really good at it. And I was just kind of in the middle, you know. Uh, I, could, I could do what I needed to do, but it didn't, sometimes it didn't look too pretty. But anyway, we built this shed, and we learned what it takes for the structure to be sound. Like if you didn't get your walls in the right place or you didn't, <coughs> Excuse me. You didn't line things up straight. Your roof was going to be cattywampus, right? It was going to be crooked. And so we learned those lessons of how to, how to build a small shed. So I guess if we ever got zombie apocalypse, we would know how to build a small shed. But no, those are good life lessons. Those are good things to know. Good, And I appreciate the, the things I learned from my dad and also from Mr. Lippelman. You know, having Mr. Lippelman as a, as a as a, this is, the sermon is not about Mr. Lippelman, but having him as a shop teacher is kind of like having your dad teach you something, right? You know, when your dad teaches you, he yells and, you know, oh, you're doing it wrong! But no, uh, I don't think it was always like that. But you, you learned, we learned how to swing a hammer, we learned how to use the bandsaw, we learned how to use all those tools and how to put things together and try to make them look nice and how, to, how, how for them to be sound. And, and so when I, that, 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 that time for me in, in shop class, as I was reading this, this, this passage of scripture, it kind of came back to me and reminded me how important it is for us as the church to know how everything fits together. That if we're going to build a church, if we're going to be the people of the church, we've got we to gotta know how things fit together. We've to, we, we got to be on the same page. We've got to get things straight. We've got to get things right. Or the roof's going to be cattywampus, right? Things aren't going to work the way they're supposed to work. Things aren't going to be structured the way that they're supposed to be structured. And Peter helps us out here in this passage of Scripture and in this sermon I've titled, uh, Simon says, Be Built Up. And so I'm going to start here in, si in uh, Simon, Simon Peter, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2. I'm going to begin with verse 4. I'm going to read through verse 10. And coming to him as to a living stone, which has been rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him will not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe, but for you who disbelieve. The stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word. And to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. And you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Mercy. God bless the reading of his word here this morning. And so we're going to be talking about the, the command here that we receive from Peter to be built up. What does that mean and what does that look like? And he actually talks about two different things here that we need to, be, that we need to do in order to be built up or two different ways actually that we are built up. And the first one I, I think is pretty obvious when we read there in that, in that opening um, lines of this passage, we need to be built up as the temple where God resides. He's, he's, he's using metaphorical language here, right? He's not talking about the fact that we are somehow physically, like we're, we're, we're going to stand in the shape of a house or a temple, and then we're going to be the temple. He's talking metaphorically about us being stones that are being built up into the temple, but the language he's using is going to be very familiar, especially to the Jews, because the temple and temple worship was a very, very valuable part of their culture and the way that they worshiped. But Paul, excuse me, Peter borrows actually from the Old Testament because it was God's plan all along that his people would be the place where he resides. In fact, he says in Isaiah chapter 66, Verse, or, or let me back up. Okay, I got ahead of myself. Uh, the, the, the temple was the place where God resides, right? So 
um, when, when God says he's building up his temple, he's building us up to be the place where he, res he resides. Now, God does not need a place to live, right? We, we should know that. That should be pretty evident, right? God is, is all-powerful. He's om omnipotent, omniscient, all those omni things that God is. He doesn't need uh, four walls and a roof over his head. In fact, if you go back, this is where Isaiah comes in. Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Uh, it's, it reads this. It says, this is the prophet speaking. Thus says the Lord. Now listen to this. Does this sound like God needs anything? Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where, where, there, where then is a house you can build for me? And where is a place that I may rest? So what is he talking about? Why is he talking about building us up as this um, temple when God doesn't need a temple? And we read in the Old Testament that there was this temple where, where God lived. And that's, that was very, like I said, very important part of their worship. But, but, the, but the prophet here, and there's other places in scripture where we see that God doesn't require a building. He doesn't require a house. And in fact, that's kind of what set him apart from the other gods that the Israelites would have been familiar with. Their gods resided in temples. They needed a place to reside. But our God is a, is a great and mighty God. He says, look, I sit on the throne of heaven. It, that's my throne. And the earth is just my footstool. That's just where I place my feet. I don't need a building. I don't need a house. And yet, God prepares a temple for his presence to reside because he desires for his people to be with him. It's not so much that, that, he, that the temple was built so that God would have a place to be. But it's a, it, the temple and the tabernacle were there so that, God could, could, so that the people could know that God was with them. Right? It wasn't because they needed him. It was, it was for their peace of mind. It was, you're going to be my people and you want me to dwell with you. Well, this is what's going, this is what's going to be needed for me to dwell with you. And in, in Exodus chapter 25, when Moses goes up to the mountain, he receives these instructions for the tabernacle. Now, you may hear me use the word tabernacle and temple. And I, forgive me if I use them interchangeably. They are two different things, but they did serve the same purpose. It was the presence of God. The tabernacle was the presence of God when they were nomads, when they were moving around. And then the temple was built in Jerusalem, and it, it functioned the same way that the tabernacle functioned. It's where God's presence was. But in Exodus chapter 25, when Moses goes up to the mountain, he receives instructions on how to build this tabernacle. It wasn't their instructions. It wasn't what they wanted. It wasn't the, the way that they wanted to do it. God had very specific instructions. If you want my presence, then this is how you're going to behave. This is how you're going to worship. This is the tabernacle that you're going to build where my presence is going to reside. Now, if you're familiar with the story of Exodus, and you, and you probably are, is uh, Moses is up on the mountain for a long time, right? And the people get anxious and they get antsy. And so they, they're worried that, Moses is gone and God is gone and they want God's presence. And, and I, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I've been on this journey for the last couple months where I've been studying this account in, in Exodus quite a bit and I've learned some new things. Uh, oftentimes when they, we talk about them building that golden calf because they wanted a God, but here's the thing. If you read in the scriptures too, there's something that I missed that I, that I, for, that I, I never noticed before. They say, let's have a festival to Yahweh. Their intentions were to worship God. Their intentions were to have a worship service, a festival, a ceremony that would honor Yahweh. That's God's covenant name. But they had been, think about this, they had been in captivity. And they weren't sure how that happened. Now this is how, this is how the other guys do it. So we're going to build this golden calf. And that's where God's going to be. In fact, if you, and, and something that I learned was that... Uh, the ancient gods are oftentimes depicted riding on the back, uh, standing on the back of a bull. Kind of like, um, uh, like a surfboard, but they're standing there. If you look at some of the ancient writings and some of the ancient pictures, these, these pagan gods are standing on the back of a bull. And so I think in the Israelites' mind is if we build this calf, this, this golden cow, God will come down and he'll be in our midst. And when God 
and Moses comes down the, the mountain and he sees this revelry, and God is furious because that's not how that's not how you worship me. And, and, and something could be said. A little side note here: something could be said about people. This idea sometimes we get in our head is, well, God knows my heart, God knows my intentions, right? The Israelites had good intentions, but it was wrong, and God was furious. I think God wants us to seek how he wants to be worshipped. He wants us to seek out in scripture how we are to behave and how we're to worship and how we are to be in his presence. And he's ready to wipe them all out and start all over again with Moses. And Moses says, okay, let's just, God, let's just calm down, take a deep breath. <laughs> and and um, not to get into too much more detail, but Exodus 32, they build the calf. And then in Exodus 36, um, Moses comes back down the mountain with a new set of tablets and they begin construction on this tabernacle. This very specific place where God's presence is going to dwell. And then they take this tabernacle with them. And he has very specific instructions on how you pack it up and how you unpack it and where everything goes. And who can carry this and who can carry that and who can touch this and who can touch that. Very specific in its structure, in its construction. Very specific in how, it's, it's, um, how they uh, carry it from one place to the next. Very specific on how... God's presence resides amongst his people. And then in, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, they've, they've kind of settled down in Jerusalem. This is some time has passed. King David is on the throne. And King David looks around and he sees this magnificent house that he lives in. And he says, God doesn't have a place to live. And so he decides in his mind that he is going to build this temple for God's presence to reside on a permanent basis. No more moving the tabernacle around. Now we're going to have this permanent location for God's presence to reside. But God says, David, you can't build the temple because of the violence uh, that's been in your household. And so your son knows, your son Solomon, he is going to build the temple. And so it isn't until Second Chronicles chapter 2 where Solomon begins the construction of this temple that we know about and we read about in the rest of Scripture. So the temple was the place where God's presence resided. And, and God was very specific about what it looked like, how it was put together, and how worship took place in his temple. Again, he didn't need a house. The heavens are my throne. The foot is my footstool. But if I'm going to reside with you, this is what it needs to look like. This is what it needs to be like. This is what worship has got to, to be and look like. So now we fast forward thousands of years of temple worship. We fast forward to the New Testament. And now God's presence is no longer in this temple. But God says he wants to reside in mankind, in his church. Listen to that word again. Listen to these words again. He says, um... You also, as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, into a temple. And I think the, the emphasis there also on the fact that he's not talking to Scott specifically or Kim specifically or Darlene specifically or Bob specifically, although it does apply to us. He's talking to the church and building you up I'm going to reside now in you. But here's the thing. Jesus is the cornerstone of God's temple, the temple that God is building. Not, not, the, not the one that we think of in Jerusalem, but the one he's talking about here now. Jesus, he says, is the cornerstone. How important is that cornerstone? When I go back to Mr. Lippelman's class, I'm reminded how important the square is, the T-square. I'm reminded of how important the, the level is because you want straight lines. You want everything to be perfect or what? Your roof is cattywampus. It's crooked. In ancient times, the cornerstone was the marker that everything was based off of. So the lines were straight based on the cornerstone. And if you had a bad cornerstone, if you had a crooked cornerstone, if you had a, a cornerstone that wasn't worth very much, right? You got it on the cheap one on eBay. It <laughs> didn't work out very well for your, for your building. But the cornerstone, that is Jesus. What do we know about Jesus? He's perfect, right? He's God in the flesh. And, and, and Peter reminds us here that God is building this temple out of human, out of, out of the church, out of people, 
these living stones, as Christ as the living cornerstone, the risen Christ as the living capstone, the cornerstone where everything is, is, is derives its, its position and its direction and its perfection from. Christ is the perfect cornerstone, the precious cornerstone. And he's quoting here from Isaiah chapter 28 when he says, when he, he uses this language about the Messiah, about Christ coming and being this perfect corner capstone. This, and then he, he does mention too, though, that it's a stumbling block and it, it's a stone that the, the builders rejected. He's, he's speaking, meta, he's speaking uh, prophetically uh, of the Christ that he would be rejected, that he would be condemned. And we know that that's true. We know that Jesus was rejected. He's rejected today. We know that, that Jesus is a stumbling block to many who hear the message of Jesus Christ. But he is the perfect cornerstone for the church, for God's people, for the living temple that God is building up programs, personalities, those cannot be cornerstones in a church if a church is going to be healthy. If a church is going to be healthy, it needs to have Christ as the cornerstone. Now this imagery reminds us, it reminds me that we, the church, are the dwelling place of God, right? Isn't that what he's saying? He's, when he's building up this living temple, it's because God wants to be with us. And how does he want to be with us? He wants to be near us. He wants to be in us. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit in us. That's Christ. That 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 is Christ's uh, message to the to the apostles before he left. I'm leaving so that the Advocate can come, and and the promise that God gave us, or Jesus gave us, that He would never leave us nor forsake us, is fulfilled in the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the imagery here that we get now in Peter as he's building up. This living temple with Christ as the cornerstone is reminding us and telling us clearly that God is going to dwell with us by dwelling in us. You are living stones and you are being built up as this spiritual house. And so if, if the church is being built up by these living stones, how important, how important is it that we all be here together? That's a, that's a question you can answer. Very important, right? Um, I read a statistic the other day. Uh, and actually, the statistic might be a year old, so maybe it's a little different. But anyway, um, that regular church attendance is now um, 1.7 Sundays a month. So people that are considered regular church attenders attend church 1.7 Sundays a month. Now, if my math, I'm not a math, I had to substitute for math earlier this week and it was bad. I'm not a math person, so I hope I got this right. Um, that's like 42% of the time, right? Something like that. I mean, sometimes there's fifth Sundays, so it might be a little bit different, but about 42% of the time. Regular church attendance is now just going to church 42% of the time. And I'm just wondering, how well would your house stand up if you only had 42% of the bricks? Or 42% of your roof. Or 42% of the studs. <laughs> right? Would you still have a job if you only showed up 42% of the time? I mean, not, not the, the weatherman is the only person I know that can be right 42% of the time and still, and still keep his job. And, and so, I just, this challenges me and reminds me that, 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 that for us to be the dwelling place of God, we've got to be better than 42%. I don't, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not kicking anybody for going to play, going on vacation, or things come up and things like that happen. But we've got, we got to be committed to the building here, right? It's too often, we, when we read Scripture and we read and we, passages like this, we think that maybe God is just talking to the individual. But I think he's talking to the, to the congregation here. He's building us all up. We are all in this. We all, I need you and you need me. And we can't, you know, we can't function if you're just at 42% capacity. We need you to be pushing towards 100. We need to be involved and engaged in the life of the church. That, and that's, that's the intention that Paul mentions here. That the, that the church is built up by living stones. And we cannot survive on 42%. So... He spends some time talking about being built up as the temple. But then he, 
He uses this, this other imagery that we find in the Old Testament as well, because there wasn't just the temple, but there were priests that served in the temple. And, and in this passage, he says that we are, we are the temple, but we are also the priesthood. And so we are being built up as the people of God, not just as the temple, not just being present, but also being active in the life of the church. It, it, and it's a privilege, he says, to be called the people of God, isn't it? Listen to the, listen to the words that he uses when he, when he describes the people of God. He calls them chosen, chosen people. He could, have taken, he, could have, he could have picked any one of us, and he picked you, and he picked me. We're chosen people. The, the, the privilege of belonging to Israel now belongs to the church of, of Jesus Christ. The church does not replace Israel, but it does fulfill the promises made to Israel. And all those Jews and Gentiles who belong to the true Israel are now part of the new people of God. He calls us chosen people. He calls us a holy nation. We talked about what it means to be holy last week. We talked about what that means being set apart, and being set apart for a special purpose, to be used of God. And, and the church of Jesus is a people who are set apart for the Lord to enjoy his special presence and favor. He calls us his holy nation. And he says that we're a royal priesthood. Now this is important. Israel's priesthood what, um, was to mirror to the nations the glory of God, the glory of Yahweh, so that all the nations would see that no God rivals the Lord. And he's calling us now oh, a royal priesthood. So there, we are part of the building, but we are serving in this living temple. We are reflecting God's glory. We are taking God's glory to the nations, to our neighbor, to our workplace, to our school, to the grocery store, to the gas station, wherever we might do our hobbies. If we're driving down Main Street and somebody cuts us off, we are representing the glory of God to the people. And that's what it means to be the royal priesthood. This is not just up to me or the elders to represent God's glory. It's up to us as the body of Christ. We're called to be built up as a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. And I love this last one, God's special possession. Do you have something precious? Do you own something that's extremely valuable to you? And it may not be worth anything to anybody else, but it's valuable to you for one reason or another. It might be an heirloom. It might be a, one of your children's. Uh, we have this uh, drawing in our house. I think Jordan did it. And one of us, I don't remember the family members, but it's got two heads. And he tried to scrubble one out because he didn't like the way it looked. But somebody's in our family's got two heads. But you know what? It's framed. It's on our, it's on our mantle because it's precious to us. And it may not be precious to anybody else, but it's, it's precious to us. And you guys may have something like that. Maybe a, 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 a ring or a necklace or some earrings that you inherited from a family member. Uh, anything like that. Do you have a, a precious possession? The scripture says here that we are God's special and his precious possession. Are we not made in his image? Are we not called his children? And that's what we're called to be here. To, to be built up because we are his children. To be a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, and a, and a chosen people. And so when we look at this, this teaching here that Paul is, is taught, it, it has, has said, okay, you got to be you know, living stones being built up. you got to be built up as the people of God, the priesthood of God. What's, what's the point of all this? Okay, okay, Simon, what do we do now, right? So you've given me this information. Um, what do, we, what do we do with it? Well, the scripture says here in a couple different places what we're to do. First, it's in verse 5, very end of verse 5, or maybe in the middle, middle part of verse 5. He says, well, I'll just start with verse 5. You are also living stones, and you're being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Those are the two things that we're supposed to do, right? The house and the priesthood. And he says, offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. What do we do with this? 
Well, now we worship. Now we worship. We offer up these spiritual sacrifices. Now, in the Old Testament, they offered up lambs and goats and bulls or, or crops or something like that. There was some sort of sacrificial system. There was a sacrificial system in place, and you offered up some kind of object as a way of worshiping God. But here he says, now we offer up spiritual sacrifices. I'm going to appeal to Paul in Romans chapter 12 when he said, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. I had somebody tell me one time that that, that passage of Scripture was offensive to the Jews. They would have really had a problem with that, imagining offering your, your body as a living sacrifice. And I said, that's the point. <laughs> it's supposed to be offensive. It's supposed to be graphic. That's, we, we offer our lives as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It pleases Him when we live sacrificial lives, when we put ourselves aside and put God first. We put our will aside and we serve God first. We put ourselves aside and we love our neighbor as ourself. We, when we're building ourselves, when we're being built up as a living temple and as, and as part of the priesthood, we're offering up these spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing to God. Again, not what, what I think is pleasing, but what God thinks is pleasing. What does God say honors him? Regardless of what my heart says or what my intentions are, we need to think and search out the scriptures and find out what pleases him, what honors him. And then the, the, the second one we find in, in, in verse 9. I'll read that, uh, reread that too. He says, but you're this chosen race, a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people uh, of God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of the darkness and into the light. We have an opportunity now then to share what God has done in our life. We proclaim the excellence, excellence of God. He's excellent. He, he, he called me out of the darkness and into the light. And, Paul, and Peter, excuse me, goes on here at the end of that passage. He says, you guys were once people of the darkness. You used to walk around in the darkness, but now you're in the light. And you need to tell other people about that. You need to tell other people how great the light is. Right? We were all, I remember when I was in the darkness, it, and I didn't even know I hated it until I got into the light. <laughs> and so if, if God has done something in your life, if, if he is building you up, if he, is, if he has transformed you, if he has saved you, you need to proclaim the excellence of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. That's right. I don't know, well, I don't know what to say when I, I don't know how to share my faith. Right there. I was in the darkness, and now I'm in the light. And the light's much better than the darkness. <laughs> so that's what we do with this information. We offer spiritual sacrifices that are pleasing to God, and we proclaim the excellence of God who called us out of darkness and into light. Now remember, you used to not be in the light, but now, now you are in the light. So I'm going to wrap up by just offering an op opportunity for you to respond to this message. Not because I have authority to say respond, but because Simon says respond. <laughs> Because the word asks us to respond to what we've heard. And maybe you've been walking around in the darkness. Praise band, come on up. Maybe you've been walking around in the darkness and, and you want to be in the light and you've never been in the light before. Let's, let's, let's talk about that. Maybe you know, God is stirring in you about salvation, about, about being built up, being a part of this temple that's being built up. And you know, maybe you're, maybe you're 42% in it. You know, and you don't want to afford to percent it anymore. <laughs> and you want to make a, a faith commitment that this is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to be people of the word. We're going to be faithful to the church. We're going to serve faithfully here. And if, and if you've never made a commitment to the body of Christ or a body of Christ, we, we want to invite you to be a part of this body. Be a part of this building. This isn't the only building. This isn't the only church. But this is, this is a part of God's body that he is building up with living stones. And you can be one of those living stones here today. And, and perhaps there's just something you need to pray about. You know, maybe there's something going on in your life that it's not even related to anything we've talked about. And that's fine too. You just need somebody to sit down with you and pray with you. And we can do that too. We've got men and women here 
besides myself, I know that would love that opportunity to pray with you. So let's stand. We're going to sing a song this morning just to kind of help us think about that. Because I think sometimes we, we, uh, we put too much focus on, on what we like. And, and like I said, our, our good intentions, we need to remember that all that we do needs to honor God the way he wants to be honored. This is about him and not about us. And so if you have a decision to make, uh, make sure you come and find me after church. And let's talk about that decision. So.